Okay, so today's topic is basically, actually, if anything, kind of a review or a reintroduction of some linear algebra ideas that relate to DSP, okay? And so this is actually, I think, good for just general engineering knowledge. The idea is least squares. And then towards the end of class, we're going to talk about what's called recursive least squares, okay? And so again, some of this is probably going to be, hopefully, review, because it more or less comes down to solving a linear system like minimizing the difference between ax and b over some vector x, OK? And so hopefully, this is a problem that you've seen before. But it's good to see kind of reformulation and also to remind you of how it relates to some of the DSP problems that we've been talking about, OK? And so kind of the, the context of this, for our purposes, is very similar to the setup for the Wiener filter, right? So the setup for the Wiener filter is that we have a desired uh, output sequence. Which we're going to call D of M. We have an input sequence, X of M. And we have a filter, H of M. Right? And so kind of what we talked about before the exam was, how can we design the H of N to drive the desired output to the actual, or to drive the actual output to the desired output. But we talked about that in kind of a statistical sense, right? We use probability ideas. We use this autocorrelation matrix. But we could also think about these as if this was a purely linear algebra problem, right? Where this was a set of numbers, this was a set of numbers, this was a set of numbers. What is the best set of numbers for the filter to drive the filter of the input sequence to turn into the output sequence, right? So I can set that up as a basically a pure linear least squares problem, okay? So I want to talk about that a little bit today. Okay, and so again, the model for how all this stuff is related is that the desired output is presumed to be like an FIR filtering, where the filter is length m of the input. And I'm going to assume that maybe I can't filter the input exactly to get my output, but there is some error. And the error is what I want to minimize, right? And this is basically like what's called a linear model. Right? So the output is basically a linear combination of the input modulo some error that makes the you know, projection not exact. Okay? And so the problem setup is if I'm given the x and I'm given the d, find the h that minimizes the error. Right? That's the kind of setup of a typical linear least squares problem. So it's, the idea is given the set of inputs and the set of outputs, find the set, you know, of filter taps that minimizes the sum of the errors. And so I'm just kind of going to indicate here that here I'm kind of summing up the errors over some interval, right? So it may be possible that I don't care about the errors over all infinite time. Maybe, for example, I just care about the most recent, you know, 50 errors, and I want to make that error as small as possible as time goes on, right? Maybe I do care about all the errors, but the idea is that this, you know, this guy here, the n1 and the n2, kind of define the limits where I care about things. And either of them could be infinite if I really wanted to make them infinite, okay? And so the error at time n is the difference between what I want and what I got, the output of the filter. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this like a matrix vector equation, right? This is actually a very handy thing to be able to do. You kind of got a taste of it on the exam a little bit, right, where I asked you to take this filter design problem and write it like a linear algebra matrix vector product, right? That kind of skill of being able to look at an equation like this and say, oh, this is nothing but a linear system, that's the kind of thing that you guys should be developing as engineers to be able to look at this and say, okay, I can see how I'd write this as a set of linear equations, right? So let's suppose, for example, that I think about this error where, you know, n1 is 0 and n2 is some capital N minus 1. So this is like saying, 
I care about the first n, capital N, errors, right? So I would write this guy here as saying, OK, I have the past capital N minus 1 errors. And those are given by the uh, difference between the past n minus 1 desired outputs and they're multiplied by this matrix, which I'll fill in in just a second. And then let's think about what is the stuff I'm trying to minimize. Actually, maybe what I should do, or should have done, is to make it clear that here, this h vector on the right has only m taps, right? Those are the m filter taps. And what multiplies this vector? Well, for the first guy, it's like saying I would filter this by x0, x minus 1, x minus 2, dot, dot, dot. The next guy would look like this. And this is just kind of like writing out the formula for convolution in matrix form. And actually, if you look back in your notes, we have a kind of a similar expression like this. When we were talking about how the uh, DFT could be written as a matrix equation, and we talked about how linear and circular convolution could be written like a matrix vector product, right? So this is actually the same kind of thing that you can go back in your notes around the time of the end of the first exam and look at this. And so this is basically, I have n by 1 errors, n by 1 desired outputs. This here is n rows by m columns, and this is an m by 1 matrix of unknowns, right? And so this is basically like saying, I have a vector e that is equal to d minus a h, right? So let me stop and ask about the setup. So does that make sense? Any questions about how I got here? OK, so you'll notice, especially as you go forward in your study, that most of the time, you know, as engineers, we will not write stuff so much like this as we will write them like this. And so it's kind of good practice to get into the habit of thinking about things like matrices and vectors, right? And so the cost function that I want to solve, right, what I want to do is I want to minimize the norm of this vector, basically like the length of this vector. And so what I want to do is I want to minimize the norm, the two norm of E. That's like the sum of the squares of the entries. And that's the same thing, since I know that E is the difference between the desired and the actual. That's the same thing as basically saying I have a vector transpose this vector. Again, I'm kind of assuming everything is real valued here. You can make this complex valued if you want. And now I can multiply all this out. I can say, OK, I've got d transpose d minus h transpose a transpose d minus d transpose a h plus h transpose a transpose a h. Right? And now I think about, OK, so I want to minimize this over my set of filters apps, right? So what would I do? I would take the gradient, and I would set it equal to 0, right? So kind of like you know, the gradient equal to 0 is kind of the same thing as like taking the partial derivative with respect to h and saying that equal to 0, right? So this is a constant. This is going to be a vector, and a vector, and a vector. So basically what I'm going to get is I'm going to get minus 2 a transpose d plus 2 a transpose a h, right? So kind of like this is like a linear term, so the h drops out. This is like a quadratic term, so the h stays in. Now I want to set that equal to 0. So it's like saying I have a transpose a h equals a transpose d. And so that tells me that my optimal h, my best h, is a transpose a inverse a transpose d. Right? And so this is a very standard result, and hopefully something that you've already seen in a linear algebra class or IEA. Right? This is like saying, if I want to minimize the error, what I do is I basically, this is kind of like thinking about projecting d onto the column space of a. I'm going to show a picture of this in just a second. Hopefully this, this equation is not like something that you've never seen before. 
Question. So what is the derivative of H transpose? Right. So let's let's think about this for a second. I think I talked about this in one of my previous lectures, but let's figure out why is the derivative of this equal to this, right? So suppose that I have, you know, um, suppose I have the derivative of h transpose times some vector, right? And so because this is a scalar, this is the same as this, right? It's like the dot product of two vectors doesn't matter which order I do the thing in. And so this is like saying if I have h1, a1 plus hm, am, right? So the partial derivative with respect to hi of this is equal to ai, right? So that means that the gradient is equal to a1, am, which is the same thing as a, right? The other one, which I kind of skipped over, is a little bit trickier, but we can think about it for a second. So let's think about what is the derivative with respect to hi of um, h transpose ah. Okay. Well, let's think about it. That's like saying I have a vector h1 through hm. I have a matrix, and then I have h1 through hm again here, right? And so if I were to really enumerate these matrix elements, right, what I would have is if I spell it all out, I would have H1 through HM times A11H1 plus dot 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 A1M HM, AM1H1 plus dot 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 AMM HM. Now if I multiply that through again, I would have basically h1 times a11h1 plus dot 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 a1mhm plus this. And now I'd ask, okay, so what is the derivative of this with respect to one of these guys, right? Well, what I would have would be basically um, the derivative here would be a11 h1 plus this guy. That would be like the chain rule here. Then I'd have an extra a11 h1 from this guy. Then an, over here where I have h2 times this stuff, I'd have an extra a21 uh, h2. And then I'd have an extra a m1 hm, right? And I can see that this is basically the same as uh, 2AH, right? I've got two copies of this, and I'm multiplying it by twice, right? So that's kind of how I got from this derivative here to this, right? It's 2 times this matrix times H. So yeah, I mean, it's good to do that derivation. I know I skipped over it, but that's kind of good to start to do also is think about how you take matrix derivatives. OK, so this is the result that I want, right? And this here, you know, sometimes you'll see this called a, and you'll see like a little um, cross, for example. This guy here is often called the pseudo inverse of A. The reason that it's called the pseudo inverse and not the actual inverse is that, again, A here in my setup was a n by m matrix, a non-square matrix. I can only take the inverse of a square matrix. So instead, this is kind of like the closest thing to an inverse that I can get. OK, and so the kind of more geometric intuition, which is always good to think about, is that you know I have a set of vectors here. This is kind of like the set of vectors I can get by combining columns of A, OK? Because that's really what I'm doing when I'm multiplying this by this, is I'm basically taking a weighted combination of columns of A, right? And what I'm trying to say is, I want to combine the columns of this matrix to get as close as possible to this target vector. And the problem is that that target vector may not be representable as a set of combinations of these columns. So instead, what I have is saying, OK, my target vector I can think of as being you know, somewhere out here. That's my desired thing. And what I want to do is I want to find the vector in this space that is as close as possible to that vector. And you can kind of see by kind of geometric intuition that what I want to do is I want to project that vector 
down onto this space of columns, right? So that's like saying that, you know, if I were to choose this point over here, then my error would be really large, right? The way I minimize my error is by making a right angle between the desired vector and the space of the column space, right? So the, the way I minimize this is by pushing this guy kind of orthogonally right down onto the space to beta right, make a right angle. Another way to think about that is that's like saying that the error, right, which is this vector, should be perpendicular to this space, which is like saying that if I take a transpose times this thing, I should get zero, right? The error is orthogonal to the column space of A. And if I were to write this out, that just means that I get the very same H star that I got before. So this is kind of a more geometric way of getting at why the answer is what it is. And so what I can do is I can say I can write my desired vector as AH star, which is this vector. That's the part that I can do in the column space of A. And I add to it the error, which is the part that I can't do in the column space. So again, I wish I could teach you guys a whole course on linear algebra. I mean, I would love to teach a linear algebra course for electrical engineers, but uh, alas, I can't. So this is the closest I can get. Um, but this is, you know, again, I would definitely recommend, you know, if you look at this and you think, ah, I kind of get this, I kind of remember this. You know, it's always good if you're intending to do further study in electrical engineering, I would recommend taking the actual 4,000 level linear algebra class in the math department, right? Something where it's purely setting up matrix equations, really understanding linear systems, really understanding eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? That I would totally recommend. So uh, you guys are probably all almost graduated anyway, but I mean, uh, tell your friends, your younger friends, take linear algebra. Okay. And so let's look at why this is kind of related to what I talked about with the Wiener filter, right? So this is basically an entirely what I would call deterministic way of turning the crank on a given vector g and a given vector x to produce the h's that I want, right? How is this related to the Wiener filter we talked about? Well, let's look at what actually is going on inside these, you know, these uh, matrices and vectors, right? So a transpose a, let's remember, you know, what that a was. That a was like this matrix here, right? So a transpose a is going to be a matrix that looks like this, right? A, we said, was n by m. This is m by n. And the entries of this were x0, x1, or x minus 1, x minus 2, dot, dot, dot. Again, you know, it could be that in a real system, the input is not doing anything prior to 0, right? So some of these guys might be 0 because of things like initial conditions. Then I have these guys. This goes all the way down to x of n minus 1, x of n minus m. And if I write this here, I'm just taking the transpose of that. So now things go across the top like this. OK. And so what do I get when I multiply these things together? Kind of messy, so I'm not going to write like a ton of terms. But the first one I can see, I'm going to basically get, you know, x0 squared plus x1 squared plus stuff like that, xn minus 1 squared. The next entry, I guess I should just write down what happened here. So I'm going to get basically x negative 1 times x of 0 plus x of 0 times x of 1 plus x of 1 times x of 2. And kind of what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, this entry is basically what we talked about as an approximation of the underlying autocorrelation, right? When you guys did the homework on the AR processes, this was basically what you did to approximate the R, right? And as I added more and more terms into this, that became a better and better approximation of R. You should have seen that on homework eight, right? Where if you used only a handful of 
recent terms, your approximation to R wasn't very good, but if you used hundreds of terms, that converged to what you knew the underlying thing had to be. And so this thing is approximately N times R0. And this thing is approximately N times R1, right? Because that's the lag where these guys are separated by one. And so this thing overall is basically approximately N times this matrix R that we talked about from before, right? In fact, if you go back to my lecture notes on the Wiener filter and the uh, LMS algorithm, you will see that this is basically, this matrix is fundamentally the same as this UI, UI transpose that we kind of talked about from previous lectures. So all I want to get at is that fundamentally, this is like a, you know, just purely data-driven estimate of this underlying statistical thing, right? So it's basically a data-driven estimate of the autocorrelation. Why is it approximate? Well, because, I mean, if I don't have that many terms, I'm not going to get the... So when I talk about R in the Wiener filter, I'm talking about the actual autocorrelations, right? The ideal given from God autocorrelations, right? Here, I'm only using N data samples to get a rough estimate of it, right? So it's not the actual R, right? Does that make sense? Well, we are using a finite signal length here, right? But when I talk about the Wiener filter, originally when I introduced the Wiener filter, I was assuming that those autocorrelations and cross-correlations were known exactly and given to you, right? Because I had some sort of statistical model of the input and the desired output, right? When I have a model, I can compute those R's ideally, right? When I only have data, I can only compute them, I can only estimate them roughly, right? Another way to think about this is that, you know, R only makes sense in the context of a true autoregressive process, right? So if the process is not actually an underlying AR process where I've got these sorts of, you know, stationary statistical properties, it could be that, you know, if this was an AR process, the diagonals, I guess you can't see the point, the diagonals of this matrix would all be the same, right? But if the process is actually moving around in time, like if the statistics are changing over time, then this diagonal may not be... Uh, all equal, and that's okay because it doesn't fit my underlying model of the signal, right? So, you know, maybe I should be careful and say this is like the data driven estimate of the correlation if this is an underlying AR process. But not everything is an AR process. All I'm trying to get at is that this matrix is kind of like an approximation of R if things were AR, and in the same way, this. A transpose D, the vector that I'm trying to multiply it by, is kind of approximately N times the P vector from the Wiener filter. This is from the Wiener filter. And so really what I'm trying to do when I say that A transpose A H star equals A transpose D, what I'm kind of getting at is that really I'm solving a system that is kind of similar to this, right? Where I have R H star equals P and my H star is R inverse P. This is basically the same as like the wiener hoff equations, right? So all that I'm trying to get at is that um, this is, you know, this looks like a deterministic approximation to the Wiener filter if the process is what we call wide sense stationary, meaning that the statistics of these things don't change as a function of n. So kind of what I'm getting at is that I can fundamentally get at the same answer that the Wiener filter would give me just from using my data alone, right? Instead of having to model the process, compute the R's explicitly like you did in that homework, I could instead just crank the data through this simple least squares problem and I would get fundamentally the same answer, okay? So this is just the difference between thinking 
purely about data and thinking about underlying probability, right? So if you didn't understand the probability part, at least you could understand the way that we just crank through the data and solve things as a least squares problem. And all I'm trying to say is those two things are actually the same thing if the data is fitting my AR process model. Okay. Questions or comments? All right. So let me go back to the, to the least squares problem a second. So again, getting back just to kind of the pure linear algebra world, okay? So the setup, again, is that I have my optimal H is A transpose A inverse, A transpose D, okay? And let me make this a little bit more twisty by saying, okay, you know, I kind of assumed that I had seen capital N pieces of data, and I'm using that as the basis for estimating my optimal H, right? So for example, I could be a little more explicit and say that this would be the best estimate of H given all the data that I saw up to time n, right? Now suppose I run my system some more and I get another input and another output, right? And now I can update my filter to be better, right? Because I've got more data. And so my new filter would be something like this, right? And so the question is, do we actually have to entirely recompute the optimal filter, right? It seems like just given that little extra bit of data, the optimal filter shouldn't change that much, right? And actually, the more data that I get, the more expensive that matrix inversion is going to be to solve this problem here. And so isn't there a way to just kind of like quickly update my best filter by getting this extra bit of data? And the answer is yes, and that algorithm is called recursive least squares. So uh, we can obtain hn plus 1 star from hn without having to solve the problem from scratch. And this is called recursive least squares. And so this is kind of a neat little theorem that I always like to talk about a little bit. Um, so let's show how this would work, okay? So I'm gonna derive how it works. And so just like usual, there'll be a lot of math and derivations and I'll give you the result at the end and the result at the end is really the only thing that you need to use to actually implement it yourself, okay? And in a way, this is not that different from the, we talked about this Levinson-Durbin algorithm before the second exam, where again, we had this idea of we wanted to estimate this best predictive filter, and I found a way to just update my previously best predictive filter by modifying the modifying that a little bit and updating. Right, so that's the kind of same spirit. Right, we're, we're seeking an efficient algorithm for moving from the thing that was best at time n to think it's best at time n plus one. Okay, so in order to solve this problem, we need a hairy kind of result called the matrix inversion lemma. Okay, so this is gonna be mess. Um, so the idea is let uh, A and B be positive definite M by M matrices. Positive definite just means that all the eigenvalues are greater than or equal to zero. Uh, C is an M by N matrix, and D is a positive definite N by N matrix, okay? So don't worry about the setup too much. We're gonna, we're gonna use this, but here is the crazy lemma. This is basically says that if I can write A as this guy, so if this is true, then this is how the inverses are related. So the proof is painful multiplication 
if you were to multiply these things together, you would find you get the identity. We're not going to do that. Okay. But we are going to use this result in a second. So this is just something that I need to be able to get the result that I want later. Okay. okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the problem that we're trying to solve with a slightly different twist. Okay. So let me write this least squares problem that we're trying to solve a little bit differently. So what I'm going to do, instead of having like a window of um, instead of having like a window of n1 to n2 errors that I care about, what I'm going to do instead is say I want to minimize the sum of this thing. So let's think about what this means for just a second. This looks like a kind of messy thing. So here what I'm doing is I've got this now parameter lambda where this is what's called a forgetting factor. And why is it called that? Well, let's think about what this actually means if I write it out. That's like saying when i equals 0, what I have is, uh, let's say when i equals n minus 1, start at the top. So when i equals n minus 1, I have this error squared. When i equals n minus 2, I have this error squared times this lambda. And then I have the error from here times this lambda squared. All the way up to this lambda times the error at 0. So why did I set this up this way? So kind of the way I set it up was to say that I'm still adding up all the errors that I have, but I am allowing myself to say that errors that are further in the past are not so important to me, right? So recent errors, like this guy, I give full weight. And then the next most recent error, I multiply that by some number. Say I multiply it by 0.9, okay? The next most recent error, I multiply it by 0.9 squared, which is a little bit less than 0.9. Right? And by the time I get to the error that is back in my misty past, I'm not giving that guy very much weight at all. Because, again, in the real world, I care about making a good fit to what I have now, not what I had you know, a year ago. Right? So that's kind of the motivation, is that a lot of times I will set up my least squares problem to say, I really care about recent memory. And by tuning this lambda parameter, so if lambda is like you know, 0.999, this is almost like saying that all the errors are equally important. But if lambda is like 0.5, then older errors will become less important very quickly. So this is kind of like a more uh, general way. And if lambda is equal to 1, then I have exactly the same problem I had before. Right? This is just a little bit more general of a problem. Okay. So let's suppose I want to solve this problem here. Okay? And I'm going to set it up in the following way. So the corresponding uh, linear least squares problem is the following. So here, again, I'm going to use a little bit of notation that I should probably write down again just for uh, remembering. So here, if I let ui equal basically the vector of most recent um, entries. Okay, so this is basically you know m most recent input. Then the thing I'm trying to solve is a least squares problem looks like this. Or saying this a different way, I am solving this problem. Again, I have a uh, m by m matrix here, an m by one set of filter taps. I'm sorry, an m by uh, yeah, an m by one set of filter taps. I guess this is actually like this, right? Where these matrices are defined as follows: I have 
v n minus 1 is equal to this guy. And this z n minus 1 is equal to So what I have here basically is the same thing I had before, but with weighting, right? So here, this is playing the role of the A transpose A inverse, and this is playing the role of the A transpose D. Okay, I'm just giving this a single name, right? So now my, my phi n minus 1 is the same as the A transpose A I had before. Okay. So this is the way I would set up this weighted problem. And you can convince yourself that I should get the same, you know, matrices like this. If I were to multiply out A transpose A and A transpose D, I would get these guys here. Okay. This is basically the same as before, but with this lambda weighting. Okay. And so the idea is that suppose I've set this problem up, I've solved it at step n minus 1. Now I want to set the same problem up at step n and think about how the two solutions are related, right? And so this is basically uh, optimal uh, problem at n minus 1. The optimal problem at time n. is the following. So it's like saying, again, I have some matrix equation that I can solve, where now these guys are updated with the more recent values. So if I compare you know, this to this, this is basically saying that fundamentally, I'm just adding one more element to the sum, right? The extra bit of information that I got from observing the new x of n and the new d of n, right? So there are, there are two new terms. There's one new term here and one new term there. And this is kind of the critical idea is to say, OK, well, clearly, I'm only adding an extra term here and an extra term there. So let me be explicit about that. So let's say that my phi of m is actually like saying I take the n terms that I had before and I add the new term that I get at time n. Right? So all I'm doing is I'm splitting off the n part from the rest of the sum. And one way I think about that is it's like saying, well, if I take a lambda out of here, then what I actually have is this is the same matrix that I needed to solve this other problem, right? So here's the same matrix from time n minus 1. I can write my new matrix basically like a combination of that old matrix and some new stuff. And so to be a little more explicit, that's like saying that my matrix that I need to invert at time n is like lambda times the matrix I had to invert at time n minus 1 plus this vector times, I'm just going to put a 1 here to be really explicit. And so now what I'm saying is I need to invert this matrix, right? I inverted this matrix in the previous step, so I should be able to kind of get this inverse from that inverse very easily, and this is where my matrix inversion lemma comes in, right? So now I compare this thing to this thing, right? And I can see that here is my A, here is my B inverse, and here is my C 
D is just a 1, and C transposes this, right? So I can put, like, if I know that I've written things in this form, now I can use the matrix inversion limit to say, OK, that means that my phi n inverse is B inverse. So it's basically be the inverse of this thing. Minus, and now I have to kind of put all this crap together into this form. So let me look at this first. So here D is just a one by one uh, matrix. This D is just one plus this is going to be C transpose B C. And the top is going to be B, C, C transpose B, so like this. Oops, that's it's a phi. So I'm kind of writing my new inverse in terms of my old inverse. I'm going to make this a little bit easier by writing, you know, let let me write the inverse, give it its own notation, so I don't have this kind of inverse -y stuff floating around. So it's like saying that the inverse here is the old inverse minus uh, 1 minus lambda squared pn minus 1 un, un transpose pn minus 1 over 1 plus un transpose And if I write this a little bit differently, I can say that really what I have here is um, the same thing minus, I'm going to take a, I'm going to write this in a special way. I'm going to write this like um, this. So really what I'm doing is I'm combining this kind of whole chunk in here into this quantity Kn. So let's think about this Kn is for a second. I guess I have a one I have a one over lambda that I took out. So here Kn I'm writing as one over lambda Pn minus one un over this thing. So this here is a vector, right? So this is a scalar. This is a vector. And this is called in the in the RLS terms the gain vector. And if I actually write out what this is, a different way of saying this, if I multiply this on both sides, is kind of like saying that um, Kn is um, 1 minus lambda pn minus 1 minus 1 minus lambda this. So the gain vector is basically related to the next step here. So we're going to use this in just a second. I know this is like a, a mess of math. The point is I'm going to get you to the end. You're going to see how you use it all, right? The matrix inversion lemma is always just such a pain to work with, but this is where we're going. Okay. So this basically tells me how are the two inverses that I want related. I also have to know on the right-hand side, how are the two right-hand side vectors that I'm trying to solve related, right? So on the right-hand side, I had that my desired right-hand side was just, this is what I wrote before. And the same way, I'm going to take out the n minus 1 term and separate that out. Here. And then I can say this is the same as the lambda 
that I would have gotten if I had taken this guy out like this. And what I get is that the two right-hand side vectors are related, again, by this simple relationship here. Okay, so now I have all the pieces I need to actually show how that linear system changes, right? So this is the last push of crappy math. Okay, so this is the way the right-hand sides are related. This is the way the inverses are related, so let's put it together. So what I'm saying is that my optimal h at time n is this matrix inverse times this vector, right? Which is the same as saying I gave this name Pn like this, okay? And so I have Pn, and I just showed that this z is related to the previous z like this. And so I'm just gonna bring all this stuff out like this. And now I'm going to substitute what I know about this, right? This is the matrix that I showed was related to the previous inverse I needed. This is what I got by the matrix inversion lemma. And now I can start to make the simplifications. I can say, okay, now what I've got is these lambdas drop out, I have this thing, minus Kn Un transpose this thing, plus this thing. Yeah, this is Un. Yeah. So what does this mean? Remember that this here and this here are like the optimal solution I got at time n minus one, right? Because if I think about it, my h n minus one star was given by p n minus one, z n minus one. That's what I would have gotten at the previous step. So this thing is like saying, this is my old best filter. This is a slight modification of my old best filter. This is basically what I define to be k n d n. And so I can kind of put this together to say what I have is I have my old best filter minus the gain vector times this thing uh, like this. Which is kind of like saying I take my old best filter and I add the gain vector times, I'm going to give this a squiggly notation where this thing is defined as the difference between what I got and this. And actually, I feel like I have to transpose off somewhere to be transpose. And so kind of the way I think about this is to get my new best vector, I take my old best filter and I, and I just add to it this gain vector, and this squiggly psi variable is like saying, what would I have gotten if I had tried to predict the current output with my previous filter? So this is kind of, kind of like saying, how far off was I from doing well with the filter that I had at time n minus one, right? So if this, if this guy was zero, if I got perfect prediction at time n, well then I wouldn't change my filter at all. I would be already pretty good. But if this thing is not zero, then I modify my filter by a little bit. Okay, so this is basically here the um, basically the estimate of desired output at time n based on the best filter from time n minus one. Okay, so putting it all together, how do I actually make this recursive least square system work? So this is really exciting. I know you guys are excited because this tells me that despite all this crap that I went through to get here, 
that updating my filter, my best filter, with a little bit of new data is actually a very simple process once I've seen the structure of how the linear algebra works, right? So this is the final result. This is really the only thing that you need to get out of what I just talked about is the recursive least squares algorithm. So here are the steps. Step one is I have this gain vector. called the gain vector. Then I form this psi of n, which is the difference between how I would have done at the previous step. So this is basically the error from previous estimate. Then I update my filter by taking my old best filter and multiplying it by the gain vector plus this error. So this is like updating the filter. And then I also update the inverse that I need, which I got from the matrix inversion lemma. Sorry, minus one minus alpha. Right? So this is the basic recursive least squares idea. If I, have a, if I have the best thing at n minus 1, this is how I turn the crank to get the best thing at time n. Okay? And these are all relatively easy things to do. Right? This is just creating, this is just a couple of matrix vector products. This is a scalar. This is, again, just adding two vectors together. And this is just you know, taking a matrix that I already had and subtracting an outer product matrix that's pretty low. It's pretty easy to, to create. Right? And so there are definitely lots of extensions to this basic idea of recursive least squares. Like, what do I do to initialize this process when I don't have any data yet, right? So there are things like, how would I get you know, P0 and K0 and so on in the absence of any data at all? There are ways of doing that. Um, and then another way of thinking about this is instead of just taking my new bit of data and incrementally updating my filter, what I could do instead is I could wait for a chunk of new data to come in. Like, instead of waiting to do this data point by data point, say I wait and I do, I, I wait for 50 new data points to update my filter, and I wait for 50 more. The idea is that I can actually make a recursive least squares algorithm that updates based on the new chunk, and so instead of there being, you know, scalars here, there would be like 50 by 50 vectors, or 50 by 1 vectors instead of scalars. The idea being that the amount of effort that I have to do to update is proportional to the number of things that I'm updating with. But I don't have to do everything from scratch every time. So let's just say that, you know, basically um, extensions to, you know, block updates, that's what I just talked about, where you have a chunk of data that comes in at once. Um, you know, good initializations. So if I want to start this from the very beginning, you know, where I have, you know, not very much data, how would I do that? Um, and also, you know, there's lots of convergence analysis. Basically saying how fast or how well does this thing converge, right? And that's actually really important because remember we talked about last time, or not last time, we talked about before the exam, um, we were kind of talking about how well does this whole, like we talked about this LMS algorithm, right? The LMS algorithm was kind of like the Wiener filter where I was estimating the R's from correlations to the data, right? And so we show that the convergence of those algorithms depended on the eigenvalues of this matrix R, right? And that if the eigenvalues had a wide spread, then my convergence was kind of dominated by how big the biggest eigenvalue was. And so the nice thing about this is that the recursive least squares algorithm actually turns out in practice to, con to converge a lot faster than the LMS algorithm. So kind of my final note is that in practice, it seems, you know, recursive least squares, which is what we talked about today, converges much faster than that LMS algorithm that we talked about a couple lectures ago. Right? 
And the nice thing is that this algorithm doesn't depend on eigenvalues or anything, right? Um, and we can show that the error will basically go to zero if I crank the turn, if I turn the crank on the recursively squares algorithm fast enough, right? So basically, this is pretty much all I want to say about this topic. The idea is that this is a particular algorithm applied to solving a specific matrix vector equation that came from filter taps and trying to predict an output from a linear system. But you can apply the same recursively squares idea anywhere where you're trying to solve this linear system that comes from some data, right? And so as an engineer, if you come across some problem where you're kind of incrementally adding data to solve some big problem, you might look at this kind of algorithm to say, okay, well, maybe I don't have to solve this algorithm from scratch every time. Maybe I can apply this recursively squares algorithm, right? So even if you don't go into DSP for your career, keep this kind of thing in your pocket in terms of understanding that you can make algorithms work efficiently for you, right? That's kind of the, the take home message of the thing. Okay, so questions or comments about this? All right, I know that was like a sea of math that you weren't expecting to wash over you, but you know, this is kind of just, you know, um, I, I consider it my duty to kind of get you a little bit acclimated by exposure to thinking about things in linear algebraic ways, right? So again, even if this didn't something, wasn't something that you followed like super well, maybe it suggests that it wouldn't be worth, it wouldn't be a bad idea to take some further linear algebra stuff, yeah. Okay. Yes. If time is not important to you, so you can kind of just sample something for all time, mm -hmm. get your inputs and your outputs, and then calculate the best for time mm -hmm. um, based on those, those two, two vectors. Um, would your, your filter be better based on the whole data set? Or, um, right. So, so the question, just for the people at home, so the question is basically if I had all the time in the world, then I could afford to to do that matrix inversion explicitly given all the data that I had, right? So this, is, this stuff I'm talking about today is still kind of in the realm of adaptive filtering, where I am updating my filter on the fly based on data coming in, with the implication that I want to change things in real time, more or less, right? Or in kind of every block of data that I get. But the upshot of today's lecture was that I would get the same answer if I were to update in this efficient way as opposed to doing it all offline and taking all the data and inverting that big matrix, right? So that's the great thing is that I'm not losing anything by applying recursive least squares because I would get the same answer I would have gotten had I solved the big least squares problem, right? But you're right, I mean, these things are most relevant when you are solving things on the fly or when you're solving things where new data is coming into you, right? I mean, even if you're not solving, so I mean, this is kind of hand wavy, but I mean, Google is solving like huge problems when they index search results, right? So actually the heart of Google PageRank algorithm is this big kind of eigenvalue based thing, right? And so fundamentally they have a snapshot of what are the best ranking results given all the web pages they've ever seen so far, right? And now today comes in and they get a billion new web pages, right? So they don't want to have to solve this massive system from scratch again, right? They just want to take their best ranking results they had before and incrementally update them with the new data, right? So this kind of thing is very relevant to that sort of situation where you could never afford, in Google's case, to resolve this massive problem. Instead, you have this kind of massive solution that you've got as the best solution from some other time, and now you just want to make it better, right? So that's a good, I think that's a good example of why this kind of thing would be important in the real world is in the real world, maybe I'm not updating like one thing at a time. Instead, I'm updating with like, you know, I've got a trillion dimensional matrix and I'm updating with a billion dimensional matrix, right? Something like that, right? So, it, you know, that's the kind of scale that they're talking about for those kinds of big algorithms, right? Other questions or comments? So just kind of a forecast. We only have three lectures left after this, right? And so what I want to do in those three lectures basically is the next one is going to be on uh, quantizers and how quantizer design could work. And so basically, we talked about the sampling theorem, and that was kind of like saying, how do I discretize the x-axis, right? We didn't really talk at all in this class yet about what happens when I dis discretize the y-axis. And so I want to talk a little bit about quantization. Um, then I have two lectures on basically power spectrum estimation, which is something that's, again, 
you may be useful in maybe kind of a little bit too late, but I know some people in the class are working on, you know, uh, trying to estimate or classify things from spectra. So that's kind of a more time domain based method for estimating how the correlations that are inside a signal can be exposed. So we'll talk about that stuff after Thanksgiving. Okay, so let me shut this guy down and